Um, and then you are? I'm Siobhan. Siobhan? Okay, great. Um, and so, uh, Melissa, you're from public health, mm -hmm. um, and Carly, you're a graduate student in behavior science. Right, neuroscience is what I was remembering. And Siobhan, you're? Anthropology. Anthropology. Yeah. Wonderful. Great. And are, are you the first year? Um, second or? No, I'm 17? not. <laughs> uh, I'm uh, a recent graduate uh, of PhD program in anthropology, and I'm back now to oh, congratulations. Thank you. Wonderful. So, I, I was teaching here uh, during this, the last two summers, but this is my first non online. Ah, uh, all right. So you can see the students in the flesh. Yeah, I'm very excited to be in real time with them. I just exchanged an email with Bill yesterday. It was like, uh, wow. Um, it's hard to believe he's not around. It's great. Yeah, we're living it up in Florida. Right, <laughs> right. It's so hard to imagine. And then Davis, you are teaching where? Uh, Kogan. Kogan. And I overheard that you're first year, is that right? Uh, yeah. Um, sure. Yeah. Welcome. Welcome forward. I'm Michael Manson. I'm the director of undergraduate research and integrity. Um, and so the integrity part of it is that I, um, so you all heard me talk about undergraduate research uh, last week. Uh, but the other, the integrity part is that um, each school and the College of Arts and Sciences has an academic integrity study administrator. We have Allison Thomas, <laughs> who's the integrity administrator for the College of Arts and Sciences, and then I kind of like um, coordinate. I think is the best verb because that's not supervise or oversee. It's like um, coordinate, um, and that's that's a new that's a new position and a new role. For us to have a kind of centralized presence, the um, and so I, I work in the undergraduate studies office. Allison, uh, do you want to say anything more about yourself, college writing, faculty, and all that? Uh, sure. So uh, I'm just coming off my first year as the college's academic integrity code administrator, um, and uh, so I have a lot of. There were a lot of challenges, um, and I have some insights from that, sort of anecdotally. Um, but also the amount of data that the college keeps is pretty significant and looking into that has been really interesting. So um, I'd like to talk a little bit about that today. Um, but I'm coming to the role from uh, the college writing program where I've taught for over nine years actually and as an adjunct that was here. Um, <laughs> I still think of Allison as we've back <laughs> um, And in the writing program and in composition studies and study of rhetoric in general, there's a lot of research about um, specifically plagiarism, but also about how students think about research, how they think about information. We have a lot of overlap with our librarian colleagues. Um, we talk about things like information literacy and how um, students process information and uh, use information. Certainly a lot has changed in that way in the past 10 or 15 years um, with our electronic resources and things like that. Um, so a lot of my own research kind of seeps into my interest in academic integrity. I came to this not because I was sort of like, hooray, I would like to punish people. Um, I was really thinking about, um, I can learn a lot about how students are thinking about uh, research and the academic experience and um, the kind of conversations they're having, the kind of communities they're joining or not, um, choices that they make. Um, and really, my interest is beyond the punishment in what can we do to develop our teaching, what can we do to get our students to learn what they need to know to be able to make good choices. That's really my interest in the kind of education of it more than in the punishment of it. And then truly also part of the panel is Sineen Bakar. Uh, did I get the both? Sineen Bakar, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Um, so not really. <laughs> <laughs> and Sineen is the director of the International Students and Scholar Services Office. Um, and so. Um, Always happy to work with the international students. You all need a shorter name. I know, but that's still uh, too many letters. I, I know. Uh, but I um, working with yeah. the international students and scholar services has uh, is, is been a delight. Um, and as you guys, you know, especially the people who are new to campus, looking at the buses that talk about how great AU is at internships and uh, job placement and Peace Corps and all those kinds of great things. What the buses don't talk about is that before we got a reputation in any of those things, mm -hmm. AU had a reputation um, for being great with students, um, and especially students that had learning disabilities, and especially students who were struggling. So our academic support and access center was one of the 
first things that got in you on the map. Um, and so that, you know, I, I, that's a really important tradition to kind of follow through, I think, as faculty. Um, and I should have said that, you know, like, I've been here since 2001, um, teaching the literature department. Uh, before Allison, um, I was six years, for six years I was the PSC administrator for college. Um, so that means I've seen a lot of cases, right? 300, 350, something like that. Um, so you're up to case 80 now or something. Um, so you get a lot of cases in CAS uh, for reasons that, that Allison will talk about later. Um, so one of the things to think about as, uh, as new faculty is that um, we've got this, these great support services. Uh, the Academic Support and Access Center um, has a booth here in the library, just down the hall, or down the hall, down the space. Um, and the writing center is also um, deeper into the, uh, on this floor. Um, then you know, Mary Graydon, is, a, is academic support still a Mary Graydon? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so call on these people. They're wonderful. Um, and you know, whenever you have a worry about a student, there's a little place on your portal where you can send a care report. Just fire something off. Anytime you have any kind of straight worry, just contact. We've got a really vigorous and great campus life unit. Um, you know, um, you know, I hate that term. <laughs> <laughs> the division, that's a better way of putting it. Um, so there's all kinds of support type people. Um, and one of the one of those key parts of um, the way we approach academic integrity at the university is we think of it as an educational rather than a punitive or disciplinary action. Right? Um, the, um, so you know, that's just kind of the basic philosophy of it, and we'd like to plug in to these services if we can. Um, so um, I wanted to start by just giving you guys a kind of sense of where the students are coming from, um, because this is not the first time they've written papers or taken exams. Um, they've come up through um, elementary school and middle school and, and high school, and one of the things we're being told is that this is our first group of students to have always had standardized testing in their lives. Right? They, they've never been left behind. Um, so that's kind of a key difference between their experience in the classroom and yours. Um, and, and mine as well. Um, and so <clears throat> Allison did all the images and slides. She's really great at this. Uh, <laughs> so um, there's a guy named Donald McCabe who used to work at Rutgers who's done a lot of studies on academic integrity. Um, he did a survey of 24,000 students at 70 different high schools. 64% said that they had cheated on a test in the last year. That's people admitting that they cheated on a test. When you think about how much self-deception works in surveys, the idea that 64% of high school students said, yeah, I cheated last year on a survey, that's remarkable, right? So you can kind of guess that, that many of our students coming through have had an experience either cheating themselves or watch other people do it. When you come to college, you get an experimental phase in lots of kinds of ways in life. Um, so it makes sense uh, to kind of think about that. 54% of those students admitted to plagiarism. 95% said they participated in some kind of cheating. 95, right? So we've got experienced students. They've come through here. And one of the reasons we work with Sonet's office is that you know, we know that the international experience is different. Right? They don't have the kind of high school training that we do. But that's one of the things we try to keep in mind. Um, let's see. The, um, yeah, so, and then the Josephson Institute suggests that about 70% of students have engaged um, in some type of cheating. Um, the statistics for cheating for college students is similar, right? That um, the ETS reports as high as 70% of students have cheated in some way. Um, the uh, numbers that truly terrify me where is it? Um, oh, I don't have it on this sheet. I have it on somewhere else. Um, it's graduate students. Right? Um, I'm happy to say that people in the humanities and the social sciences have the lowest rate of cheating as graduate students. Um, and, and so what's your percentage? What's your best guess of how many students are cheating who admit that they cheated while they're in graduate school? 
greater than 50. Greater than 50? You're, 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 uh, you're right for business. <laughs> that would be good. <laughs> <laughs> that would be where my context would be. <laughs> Sorry to say, but you could be happy. I, I think that you're like a couple of points below engineering, which is like really scary, right? I, I don't drive over bridges anymore. So I'm making a joke there. There was a big Ohio State scandal about 10 years ago um, where their master's program, um, and PhD program, had produced a lot of plagiarism. So yeah, it's high. No, the humanities and social sciences are lower at, at about a third. I know. It's like so. I you know look. <laughs> you look around at your classmates. You know you just you just got your doctorate recently. Uh, do you really imagine that a third of them cheat? You know, self-report that they cheated in the last year. Uh, so these are these are kind of sobering numbers. And you know, as, you know, there's lots of speculation about what's driving this: the competition, the sense of cutting corners. Um, the way that we're also hyper busy, uh, the access to the internet. So there are all kinds of speculations about why this is happening. Um, and as it happens, NPR did a, uh, a, a, a TED Radio Hour last weekend about why we lie. So go on to NPR and check it out. Why we lie? It's it's interesting. Um, produces some good insights. Um, so that's the that's the kind of uh, national background and picture coming in. Um, the uh, I, uh, oh, you like these quotations, so I'm going to give you these quotations. <laughs> uh, I I think it, we can certainly blame the internet a good amount for easy access to information, uh, and maybe what people end up doing with it. But really, this idea of, of the practice of cheating is not a new thing. This is from Charles Drake's book. Um, why students cheat a statistical search for the incentives which induce college students to dishonesty in examinations from 1941. Part of the reason I like it is because it just sort of sounds so old timey. The language is like so, like, you can kind of see like an old white guy with patches on his sleeves and like beard saying, The examination constitutes a barrier which must be surmounted before the student may disport himself in some delectable land beyond. And this sort of delectable land beyond captures my imagination a little bit. Um, in terms of what that means and what that means to students, I think it's worth sort of thinking about that as we ponder this question sort of why this happens. Um, cheating then becomes an expedient to achieve some desired goal and at the same time to avoid some of the unpleasant punitive consequences that attend failure. And this is definitely still true. Obviously, our circumstances have changed. The cost of education has gone up so much. Our students are so conscious of how much money they're spending, they have jobs, they have internships, they have a hundred other obligations, they're trying to be in this club and that club and this club and that club and be activists in this way um, and use their U-Pass to get downtown for this rally or whatever. Um, the idea of failing is um, so emotionally heavy um, that I think this from 1941 is still true. It's still kind of part of this um, bigger picture about um, why, why this happens. Um, and the story isn't different at AU in terms of the national numbers that um, Michael referenced. Um, the, the academic integrity code we have is intended to set up standards. As Michael said, our goal is education, but certainly there is a punitive element to it. Um, that um, Students have to be familiar with the code if they're held responsible for it. If they're, if they're not, then things happen, right? Um, but the code is online. This is what the front page looks like. Um, I would encourage all faculty, and I would encourage you to share with your colleagues um, how important it is for everyone to have read it, understand it, get it on the syllabus, talk about it with your students, and we'll give more specific advice um, over the course of the, um, our time together. Uh, but just to give you a kind of um, visual here, um, did you have something to add for this slide, Michael, or should I move on? Um, this? Yes, that my coordination of this stuff is new, um, and so this site's going to be built out some. I've added a video there that's about seven minutes that's written for students, and I think that most students at orientation have viewed this video. Um, and it's about like how you might be cheating and you don't even know that you're cheating, and so you might get busted, and that might be a problem. Um, because one of the things that we find is that students don't think of themselves as cheaters, so when you start talking about academic academic integrity, 
they start to zone out because they say, I'm not a cheater, but then the night before they forget that. Or they start to cut corners because it's the night before they don't think of it as cheating, um, and so they end up, they end up in trouble. Um, so that's one of the reasons I took the approach I did in that video of, of just saying, you know, you might not think that you're doing something, but it ends, you're still going to suffer the consequences of it, so you need to start thinking about it. Um, the other thing I would say about the code um, in general is um, the deans like it, right? I've, I've had um, first year faculty, and I've had adjunct faculty, and I've had term faculty come to me and say, Will I get fired if I bring a case? Right? Is, do I need to worry about this? And it's like, No, our dean loves it <laughs> when they know that you're actually paying attention to what's going on. Sometimes faculty, in other words, feel like this reflects poorly on their teaching. Um, and I hope it doesn't because I feel like I got the job because I my predecessor was best pastor. Um, <laughs> so, yes. So, um, how much exposure can we expect the students to have gotten in their welcome week? Or, like, so I talk about it in my syllabus, I have a paragraph. I mean, we spend a fair amount of time, but how? what can I assume about? what they've heard at the administrative level or in other, you know, orientations coming in, have their familiarity. Do you want to answer that one? Well, you, I got an answer, but yeah, I'm if curious you want to speak to, you certainly are on the Tony <coughs> Pony Show circuit, right. so maybe if you want to. So the, the students in orientation have heard about it. Um, they, they run across a line that says, by registering for classes, you, you um, understand what I and mean, then do you want to say what like students? <laughs> I, mean, I know that you're here to support us, but maybe you can give us a little insight on it. Uh, my, I'm a grad student, so my right. orientation is Friday. So I have oh, so you haven't even had that mention? Yeah, um, but, uh, and I haven't even had any kind of like web okay. video that I was required to watch beforehand. Yeah. Because we don't, we don't, we think graduate students are all set. Right. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah, no. Um, we need to get you a video. <laughs> we need to get a grad video. Yeah. Right. I don't know whether you still give talks to the economics master's students. I give talks to a lot of different yeah. departments and programs in arts and sciences. So um, I usually do something for the grad students in the sciences, uh, particularly biology. Um, mm -hmm. I've done economics. I've done. Uh, I'm doing a GFAP student, so all of the TAs um, who are in that program throughout the university, I'll be talking with them. Um, I try to get on as many dockets as I can because I think um, this is an important thing for students and for faculty to hear about. But I think what's complicated about your question is that you don't know. You don't know what their previous experience has been and you don't actually know sort of how much they've retained from these. Like, I I've had a lot of students in my own writing classes who will say like, yeah, I remember seeing you during that orientation, and I just remember feeling like, ugh, I'm a little bit scared and nervous about this thing because the consequences are really rough. And that's one of the biggest things they take away from those kinds of presentations. Like, ugh, I don't want that to happen to me. That's really scary. I'm not a cheater. But again, here is 4 o'clock in the morning, and your paper's due at 8, and do you, you know, you're about to fall asleep on the keyboard. Do you copy and paste from Wikipedia to avoid failure in the logic of a student? Or do you email the professor and say, whatever, your preference might be? So I think the answer is, a, have a conversation about that. What's been your experience with academic integrity? Have you had an academic integrity code in your high school or in your previous classes? What are some of the issues that have come up so that you can kind of get from them what their experience is? Obviously, they're held accountable for the code. Like Michael said, they know. It flashes on the screen, like, you signed this. Your name is in blood here. We're holding you accountable for it, right? But the extent to which they actually sort of understand that, process that, they're dealing with so much information at once. International students who are dealing also with issues of visas and things like that, um, it's a lot to take in over the course of a couple of days, a week, something like that. So they signed the integrity code, and we know that. Signed. But they kind of check a box and they register like for I've classes. Read, okay. But yeah. we don't have a culture where we have it before all the exams or, you know, we can post it on our, you know, before they submit something that 
Well, we, don't have, that, we don't have that honor to state that right. that's what you're thinking. Mm -hmm. They're alive, not achieved. Right. So I haven't seen know. that. I haven't seen that. Some Our people do it. Some people do sort of have students sign a page uh -huh. at the beginning of every test or mm -hmm. something like that, or at the beginning of class, um, mm -hmm. at the beginning of the semester. Those would all be sort of ad hoc things. And what the research suggests is that that's very effective. Yeah. Just that last minute reminder. That's right. Um, and I. Um, I used to get a case every time I assigned a Faulkner um, until I started saying before students submitted their Faulkner papers, uh, gee, you know, every time I have a Faulkner assignment, I get plagiarism. So, you know, if you did, if you plagiarize, you know, just don't turn it in today, right? <laughs> turn it in later. Um, no, and boy, I started, to, yeah, people thought about it and just mentioning it yeah. dried up those particular Faulkner cases in my classes. Um, and so, that kind of um, just at the moment you need it reminders end up being the most effective thing you can do. So I could copy and paste the yeah. language from the um, integrity code. Yeah, I don't find the language from the integrity code all that useful um, because it's all bureaucratic. Mm -hmm. uh, but what I do uh, what I do think is central important is the is the first line, the preface that we think that academic integrity lies at the heart of intellectual yeah. life. And that part's true. And so one thing I would encourage you guys to do is like shift the frame about like not getting caught to you're here to grow as an intellectual. And the way that you grow as an intellectual is that you take old knowledge and you create new knowledge. And the only way you can do that is by telling people what's the old stuff so they can see how what you're doing is new. And so if you're if you're talking about it in that way, then you have to cite so that you can show that you've developed something new, your new idea is in fact new. So the citation is about proving yourself and showing um, your intellect at work. There's also departments that have particular language that they want to kind of draw attention to a specific piece of the code. So mm -hmm. for example, um, one of the violations is inappropriate collaboration. This happens mostly in the sciences, or especially in the sciences, where we're mixing the chemicals together, but we're expected to go home and write our own lab reports, and they shouldn't look similar, even if we have the same data, right? Um, and so in the sciences, biology especially, they have, they're like, I want you to draw attention to this part of the code, because it's the thing that happens most. <coughs> In these, in these classes. And so your department might have some insight about that. But I actually, obviously, I teach a writing class. And so I do put actual excerpts from the code because I want my students to think about reading the text. Mm -hmm. and, under, and we do it as an exercise of sort of how do I read this? Mm -hmm. When it's written in a language that doesn't seem like it's for me, how do I, what do I do? And so depending on how much time you have to devote to it, it could be a useful exercise. There's a lot of legalese that students end up having to read. Mm -hmm. I want them to be able to negotiate that when they need to. So it depends on sort of what makes the most sense for your class, um, but putting it on the syllabus. And then dropping it into every assignment sheet. Uh, when I have students do blackboard posts, you know, I just put in the assignment. Make sure that you cite, it's not a paper, mm -hmm. but make sure you refer to your sources so I know what you're building on. Uh, and so just any time you make an assignment, just dropping that in, that, those little reminders. Um, it's kind of like what I do for, for the intellectual content. I know all of you have taken the literature survey. Remember how you did that? Well, this is what we're seeing in today's class. Any kind of reminder that takes them back to the page helps. Pull out the silos that we create in our academic life. The, the issue of originality, too, I think is really persuasive for this generation of students. I found um, last year the presentation I gave to incoming freshmen was about um, Vanilla Ice, and I played Ice Ice Baby, and I played uh, Under Pressure by Queen, which if you've heard those songs, you know it's pretty much the same opening. Um, Vanilla Ice borrowed it from Queen. This happens all the time in music, and I knew it was an example that students wouldn't really know that much about. Um, and so I made a show of how much I loved Vanilla Ice, this guy with the jacket with the American flag on the back. Oh, um, and <laughs> and I, really loved it. I was like, I had a poster of this on my wall. Um, but, uh, but I was like, and I thought he was like the coolest. I thought he was so smart and so original and he came up with this awesome song. And then I heard Under Pressure and I was like, wait a minute. 
that Robert Van Winkle guy is not really that original at all. And that's that's like the kiss of death for our students right now, to be thought of as unoriginal, as not unique, as not individual in some way. Yes, they want to be part of things, a part of a community, but the idea of being unoriginal is like a pretty bad insult for this generation of students in my experience. And so I think that message of sort of we build on things, our goal is originality. And so if you're not conscious of this academic integrity stuff, how can you be original? How can you know if you're being original? How can you show someone in an audience that you're being original? Um, I have, like I said, a lot of data from CAS. Um, this generally just shows you how how the numbers are going up. So this year, um, I saw 74 cases. That doesn't count the cases that I've seen um, this summer. Um, so 74 is a, a lot, as you can see. Um, CAS hosts the most uh, gen ed courses. Um, we host the college writing program. We have the most students of any college. It's not surprising that we have the most cases. We do see more than five times the amount of students that are coming from the other colleges AIC administrators see. So when our number is 74, SPA might be something like eight, right? Yep. Uh, COGOD is a little bit more, 15, 16, 17-ish per year. Um, and so th this is part of why um, my year uh, educated me so quickly, um, because I did see so many cases, so many different kinds of cases. Um, still, over over the course of this lifetime, sketched out here, the most common violation is plagiarism. Um, the next most common violation is uh, inappropriate collaboration. And then the third most is dishonesty in examinations, which is our way of referring to like actual cheating. Um, and so that happens, but not as much as plagiarism. Plagiarism is the most common. And this is why I think it's not just important to talk about like cheating. Why do students cheat? Why are people dishonest? Um, this language I still have a sort of stickiness with, and I think it's important to think and talk about. Um, because plagiarism comprises someone who is like, oh, thank you for giving me this paper assignment. I can't wait to copy and paste an essay together and hand it to you. Yeah, that kind of happens. Like, yes, students do buy papers. It happens. I saw it happen three times in the year, which is a lot more than I thought. But the majority of cases are not premeditated, I'm going to go buy a paper. The majority of cases are either like, I didn't know I had to do that, or I didn't understand that's how it worked here, or this is my first time in the art department, I didn't know you had to cite images, or um, I never learned citation this way in high school, or it was really late at night, something happened to my friend, I went to the emergency room with my friend, right? Like fill in the blank of any kind of catastrophe that could inform bad choices, right? And so it's really important to me to formulate this as like choice making. Like what are the kinds of choices that you are making as a student? Do you have all the information you need to make a good choice? If you don't, then we have to do more. Right? If, if you don't have the information you need to make a good choice, then that's a problem. Then you're going to be doing stuff that's not a good idea, typically. Um, and this gets explored in a lot of national publications. Um, but this guy is a dean from, I think he's from Florida, um, University of Florida. Um, and he talks about not just this, um, I'm cheating because I uh, am out of time. I'm cheating because uh, there's a lot of pressure on me. I'm taking a lot of classes. There's this cost-benefit analysis that happens in so many circumstances, right? This idea that failure is not an option. Uh, students don't think far enough ahead to realize that this will probably end in failure as well, probably worse than failure, right? Um, did you want to add anything to that, Michael? No. This is another meme that I saw. The sort of time spent is one of those frequent. Uh, so this is a joke, but but in some ways it, it rings true. Um, this is a lot of time to spend, <laughs> for example, copying and pasting from Wikipedia. Oftentimes I see students and I'm like, gosh, if you just took the time you spent to plagiarize this, 
I'm actually writing the thing, then you'd be in a much better circumstance. But I think what this really points out, and obviously this is a joke, um, <laughs> but <laughs> the choosing a font for my title, right? But this represents to me a kind of misunderstanding of priorities. This gets at bigger issues of teaching that happen in our classroom, right? You can't just sort of silo academic integrity off. We have to recognize how it seeps into other areas of our teaching. If the students don't understand, like, sort of how to prioritize, that, like, maybe the font for your title isn't the most important thing. Um, they're not quite getting that kind of hierarchy, and that's something that we can work on in the classroom. Allison, I remember I did have something, if you go back a couple mm -hmm. of slides, um, to the graph. If, I don't know whether that, when you see that graph, you think that's a lot of cases. I, I think of that as it's, it's a lot for one person managing. Um, but something we haven't said yet is that I love, from a faculty perspective, I love the way that we do academic integrity on this campus. I have been on other campuses where I had to do all the work, right? I had to, I had to first have a suspicion, then review the, you know, gather the materials, look up things, talk to the students, get phone calls from the dean and from parents. We take all of that off you, right? The philosophy here at AU is that faculty teach and administrators handle everything else, right? So that. Once you say, you know what, I think this is a cheating case, I'm going to give it to Dave Carr, or you would give it to Allison, or you would give it to Allison. Um, then then the, the administrators are in charge of like doing the deeper research, analyzing the paper, gathering the evidence, talking to the student. If there's an angry parent, they're talking to the parents. Um, so it's great, man. It's like, hey, I see a problem. You take care of it. It's, it's, it's designed to, to enable you to get back to the, what you know painting for, which is the teaching and research. Um, so with, when we're going through all that, realize that that's, that's Allison's load, that's not your load. The other thing I would say is that I think these numbers are low. You know, if Donald McCade's statistics are right about what's happening in high school and, what, and the statistics are right about what's happening in graduate school and in college, then why are we seeing so few cases and why are we seeing them more in the college than we are in the whatever four schools? Um, and so one of the things, and tell me whether your experience at CAS faculty has changed since my day. Um, everybody that I've ever talked to was surprised and hurt that there was cheating in their class. Even though I knew that a Faulkner assignment usually produced a plagiarized paper, I was still surprised. And I was sometimes surprised about the person. It's like, you? Kathy, man, I thought <laughs> you were one of, my, you're one of my favorite students. What the hell? What just happened here? So, it's not, I don't think there are faculty who, that we have a lot of tech, they get back and it's like, I'm not, I know there's something in this stack, I'm going to go find it. Mm -hmm. um, I think we're generally surprised, and I, and I think that we need to be still more attentive without becoming suspicious and paranoid. Um, I would agree with that. I would agree with that. Especially because, um, I don't, I, it's hard for me to categorize, because it's completely anecdotal and not data-driven at all, but I do know that we do see a number of first-generation college students. We see a number of international students. Although it's not, a, it, like most people assume that in arts and sciences we're seeing a lot of college writing papers and a lot of international students. And those numbers have changed only slightly a little bit at a time. They're, they're not huge. It's not a huge percentage. The numbers that we found that were more interesting is um, sophomores. Almost as many sophomores as freshmen are coming through the AIC office and CAS. Um, a lot of people would not have predicted that. Um, I think the biggest reason is Gen Ed. Thankfully, it's being revised, and maybe that will change some of the attitudes about some Gen Ed classes. Because if you think about it, and I've had students tell me this, I didn't want to take this class. I had to take this class. It's Gen Ed. I don't care about it. I just want to get through it. This is the fastest way to do that. And I'm just going to hope that I can push it past someone, right? And so given that attitude, these numbers for this year should be higher. But hopefully, as the new Gen Ed program rolls out, we're seeing fewer and fewer um, Gen Ed oriented cases. From the writing program, not a ton of cases, relatively speaking. We're getting some. Um, but this is a course where academic integrity is one of the subjects. Yeah. The code is reviewed in a lot of detail. The professors work very closely with students. There's a lot of face time. They get to know each other really well. 
Um, and studies show that when you talk about it, when you talk about it one-on-one, -on -one, when you get into some detail about it with your students, they're less likely to do it on purpose because they know this is a class where, this, where the professor cares about it and where I can't say I didn't know. There's no way I can say I didn't know if a professor devoted X number of minutes to it in class. I know she cares about it. I, I'm not going to um, test the waters on that. So. It took us back. <laughs> That's okay. Um, I think we can get through this one. So the types of violations, um, like I said, plagiarism, inappropriate collaboration, and dishonesty in exams are the most common. These are all listed in the code with a lot of details. Um, but I wanted you to just kind of uh, see them here. Um, we we have I haven't seen any um, bribes, favors, threats. Just for the record. Code gets them a couple of times. I've had a couple, and I've been very envious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right 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 um, double dipping is one I don't see super often, but I think it's one that students would not guess. I use the term uh, double dipping, but this is really when you take a paper that you've written for one class and you submit it to another class. Um, it's not easy to, to catch unless you've got some background and other context with the students. Um, the, the one I remember that's fresh in my mind is a class where the student left the identifying information about the class where it was originally submitted on when they submitted to a different professor. And the professor was like, this is weird. Okay, I'm going to contact that professor. <laughs> yes, the student did submit it, right? Um, but this is something that like, isn't obvious to them. It's obvious to them that you shouldn't be taking someone else's words and passing them off as your own. They know that for the most part, right? Um, but this one is not intuitive. So I would make mention of that in your syllabus, and I would let them know. Um, we have a lot of really smart students who did really well in high school and are itching to submit their best papers from high school. Um, I was talking to uh, Cindy, who is in charge of the gen ed program, and she said a student raised her hand and was like, I was really hoping to submit this awesome paper that I wrote about this. And she was like, no. No, you must dash those hopes and dreams because here, you're going to build on old knowledge. You can use sources from projects that you did before. Um, but if you're submitting the same paper, then that's a problem. Uh, this, <laughs> this is uh, Caravaggio's painting, uh, The Fortune Teller. Uh, because sometimes that's what it feels like uh, in terms of discovering uh, violations of the code. Um, you, you, don't always, you don't always know. There will definitely be things that get by you. Um, where uh, maybe you haven't seen a lot of the students' writing, so you can't really tell if this is their voice or not, or they sound different in class, but this looks different on paper. Is it wrong of me to assume that like this couldn't have been written by this person just because of how they speak in class? Um, it, it, there's definitely a lot of um, challenging uh, issues to, to discovering things. Um, and to that, I would say there are two resources. Um, one is your college's academic integrity code administrator. Um, I talk to a lot of faculty, um, and it doesn't always result in like the wheels turning into an official case. If you're looking at something and you're like, oh, I'm not sure, call, email, whatever is easiest. Um, I'm happy to talk with faculty about those kinds of things. I can't speak for my colleagues, but I'm sure, right? but I will. They are too. Um, and, and sometimes it just takes sort of talking to someone else and having someone else take a look at it and kind of working it out that way. The other is Safe Assign, which is um, similar to Turnitin was the one we used before Safe Assign. Safe Assign runs through Blackboard. Um, the library has tutorials on their website for Safe Assign for students. Students can use it. They want to submit and have um, the paper sort of scanned and it shows them sort of where uh, problem areas are. Faculty can use it as well. Faculty can have students submit work electronically through Safe Assign. These are covered on the library's um, website, and I'm going to work with them to have a workshop uh, later this semester so that any faculty members who want to use it can attend and kind of see some of the ins and outs of using Safe Assign. So I think those are the two big ones that I. Yeah, and I just want to really hammer on that. On your Blackboard site, on everybody's Blackboard site, you've got a link to Safe Assign. Any paper that is submitted to you via Blackboard, you can send through Safe Assign and have it handled. 
and we'll do text management. We'll be able to prowl the web and find out whether these sentences or phrases come from some other source on the web. It's, it's a wonderful resource to have. But we'll see that. Um, so I'm in public, public health, very much prevention uh, oriented. There you go. Right. And so I was really, I am really excited about Safe Sign. Mm -hmm. I used TurnItIn.com or TurnItIn before. Um, as a tool, and I, when I talk about it, I talk about it a lot, and all of my papers do go through Blackboard, and they're submitted, and it is going through Safe Design, but it's super clunky, and it ends up being, yeah. you know, I, I present it as a tool for them, and I say, this Good is a way for you <laughs> to check, for you to check, and for you to be mindful, and for you to be aware, and for you to catch yourself before yeah. you submit it to me. So I actually do let them resubmit within Safe Design. Yeah. Um, but it's it's not a great tool. You have to really read, you have to read it critically in the sense that it'll be like ninety eight percent plagiarized, it's very, but it's like everything's high. in quotation marks. Right, and it, it, it sometimes it, it matches against their own work cited. Yes. So yeah. yes, and if you so it's very frustrating. It's, it is very frustrating. It hasn't worked the way we all expected it. To. Yes. Turn it in is it's better. Turn the database. So yeah. like. The default is that it adds the paper to a database. So I, I tell them not to do that. If they've done it that way, then like yeah. it'll. Yes, it's a, it's a clunker. Um, so do you think this workshop that you're organizing will have more tips? Because I find it very challenging. Yeah, to maybe even interpret that report myself. Yeah, you know, and now I have like, a, oh, okay, well, thirty percent's not that bad, and that's kind of my green area. But that's really high. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Well, it's, I've never seen anything. Sensor. But it's yeah. I, I've never seen anything less than thirty yeah. percent. I've seen some zeros. Um, I'll really? see what I can put together um, for for the workshop. Although you are right, the way it works is clunky, and there are some problems we won't be able to get around. Um, so it does scare them, which is good. It does, yeah, it <laughs> brings a level of awareness. It, it, yeah, it does bring a level of awareness. But for somebody they know that I'm it. seeing it and that they're seeing it, so yeah. I think it makes them pay attention. Yes, but then work. somebody but who's done good work is getting 30%. And that's right. Like, I'm going to spend the night crying until my professor can that's respond right. to my email. And then they, I get these panicked, you know, meeting set up, yeah. you know, wanting to prove to me that really, you know, they were very yeah. conscientious in their work and they don't know why it's this report and I don't know why the report's that high either. Yeah. Yeah. We can work with that. We can work with that. When I started using Safe Sign, I Googled Safe Sign. And the top hits of after, you know, the official website is uh, ten top ten ways to beat Safe Sign, ways oh, yeah. to get around it, get your score to zero. And uh, you know it's incredible. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, it's incredibly creative. Some yeah. of it is, you know, make sure that you change every third word for a, a, a synonym. Right. Some of it is uh, put your text in Word, find and replace all the spaces as underlines, and then find and replace all the underlines and make them into white text uh -huh. and save it as a PDF. Again, this is like spending time on your font size. Right. right? Exactly. Yeah. So, so I think that it's it's. So that was my experience, and I was like, okay, hmm. that's good to know. Yeah, it's good to know that students can find that so easily, but yeah. available. But the other thing that I found is that the things that the people who were plagiarizing, or the person that I reported in my online course this summer, it was so obvious yeah. that I, it, as soon as I, I, I actually downloaded them, so I knew I'd be uh, without internet access. And that one, it was like, as soon as I opened it, it was like, okay, check, check, double check this on Blackboard, yeah. because this is not going to work. Right. And then, sure enough, it comes up and everything's copied and pasted. Right. So, I think, even though it's a great resource, it, it, it does, it, it can be a danger to rely on it too heavily. Absolutely. And it's, can stop, I think it can stop us as teachers paying attention to how our students are yeah. developing and that kind of thing and voice. Definitely. So, I agree with you 100%. I've definitely gotten reports from faculty members who have been like, here, it's that 60%. Yeah. Yeah. And I look at it and I'm like, well, here. Which, is, which is fine. But then when I look at it, it's like, well, <clears throat> the 60% is actually like a five page work cited page. Yeah. And yeah. all of the things that are flagged are in quotation marks with correct citations and it's flagged those or it's checking against itself yeah. or whatever. And so the professor didn't actually look at the report before sending it on to me. And I think you're right, it can make us 
mm, lazy or something like that, you know. But I do think also um, for those students who are putting in that much effort to replace the spaces with white underlines or whatever it is that's happening, like we're not going to catch them all. You know what I mean? And, and the really devious, deceitful occasions, we're going to miss those. And, and for those students, that's their own punishment. You know what I mean? Like, here, you paid for a lie. Congratulations. Yeah. You know? And I don't mean to sound so glib about that, but there's only so much we can do. Um, and I think part of combating that is just setting the culture as we value originality. This is about your own thought. You're here to make that happen. We're giving you all the tools that you need to do that. If you choose to circumvent that just to get a piece of paper, I mean, that happens, right? I mean, I'm getting into mm -hmm. some other ground here, but I think in that way, you can't drive yourself crazy about, like, what if there are white underlines in there somewhere? You know what I mean? There's only so far we can go. In, in my experience, because I actually teach on fraud, it's one of the things I teach about. Is, you know, you start out small, right? And then you, you yeah. have successes cheating at a small basis, and then you, you relax, and, you, and it becomes easier and easier to yeah. do it. You, eventually, you expand to the point where you do get caught. Interesting. So, you know, I, I think that probably... So you're well versed in psychology. Yeah. Something like that, yeah. Well, and you've said, you've long said, you know, this is probably not someone's first rodeo by the time they get to our office. It's, you know, probably something they've done before. Yeah. Um, I, I can't say for sure whether that's true, but I don't think that's a bad inference, you know? And we get all wound up about it. But we should keep up our pace. Yes. Um, so I think to come back around to this, um, the, to the most common kinds of cases that we see, not the sort of deceitful, premeditated cheating, but the sort of what um, what's happening at 4 o'clock in the morning, or what kind of tools and skills do I need uh, as a student to be able to make um, good choices. Um, as I mentioned, I sort of, uh, the sort of intention and honest mistake language is still something that I'm struggling with. Um, because intention is, I, I can't know. Well, to clar clarify what Allison is referring to is that code makes a distinction between an honest mistake and purposeful dishonesty. So if it's an honest mistake, there's no sanction, the case is dismissed, um, if, but if it's purposeful dishonesty, that's when you receive a sanction. Um, and so you were describing your, your yeah, I mean, struggles just, with the terminology. It's difficult to kind of come up with language <laughs> that, that works the way yeah. we need it to, and I mean, I guess such is life, right? But. Um, but I think when I meet with students, they say things like, this wasn't my intention. But what they really mean was, I don't, it's, it's, I don't, I didn't set out to do this. I knew when I did it, it wasn't a good thing to do, <laughs> right? And so I think the intention was to not get caught, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so the, that language becomes really, really sticky. Um, honest mistakes, there are some obvious honest mistakes, right? Like, um, oops. And they often start with, oops, oops, I sent the wrong document. Oops, I forgot to include my works cited page, but here it is, right? There are definitely these sort of oops moments that happen. But also, a lot of students say, oops, when it's something that they should be held accountable for. When it's not a sort of, I had this page right here and I was going to send it. It's, I created this page after I got caught and I'm going to send it. Oops, I forgot to send it, right? The message is still the same. Um, and so I think those are the most challenging cases for me, uh, which is like almost all of them, and, uh, and the most challenging for faculty in terms of like, do I report this? Do I not report this? How do I kind of negotiate um, this? Um, I thought this was really funny. This is another meme. Um, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. Um, these are sort of things that they know that they're doing that, uh, that sort of isn't a safe practice or isn't responsible um, academic behavior. But some of this gets at why this happens. Like first, the sort of like, ah, uh, this moment of ultimate stress and pressure. Um, th there's also this kind of like sounding smart. Like a lot of students end up in this situation because they feel um, 
like there are novice researchers who can't possibly contribute something new to a conversation. They don't have faith in their own choices of words or their own ideas, and so they go looking to others. I think a lot of times, um, especially for uh, some international students, I've seen a lot who will say things like, well, this person is obviously smarter than me, so why wouldn't I want to use those those words instead of, I'm not, I'm not at that level. I obviously need a smarter person to, to um, kind of say the thing. Um, so we've got some case studies that are I've put together from uh, cases that I saw this year. Um, so in each case, um, the first three are plagiarism, different varieties of plagiarism. Um, the fourth is a dishonesty and examination. The fifth, um, dishonesty in papers, which you'll see is kind of a, a different situation. And then uh, the last one is inappropriate collaboration in the sciences. And so um, I put these together and redacted all the sort of identifying information so that you could see a few things. One, here are some of the types of things that, that I see in CAS, um, but also to kind of inspire some discussion for all of us about um, what would you do if you saw this? What do you see? Um, and what are some of the things that looking at the case study just in a bubble, you would want to know? What are some of the contextual things that you would want more of? What kinds of things would you account for if you were looking at it in your class? What would matter, what wouldn't matter about uh, what you're seeing? And so, I'm not sure, I think we could probably look through all of them together. Would that make sense? Okay. Um, I'll pass them up and then I'll put the discussion questions up um, so that once we've looked, we can kind of talk about what we see. So you can see here that I've, this is my handwriting. I've marked numbers that correspond to um, text that's from this website that's included the uh, later part of the, of the packet. Um, I'd like to start with the first question. Does there seem to be a violation here? And, according to the code, and what is it? What do you guys think? So the students clearly copied and pasted directly from this website. Yeah. Was this website included in the bibliography? Yes. Although is that how the professor found it? So I was first struck by... Yeah, that's a great question. So um, the professor, when I spoke to the professor, she said, um, this this looked weird because it didn't like flow, uh -huh. right? So it wasn't just the language didn't yeah. sound like the student. It was, it seems like these are just kind of like Frankenstein's uh -huh. monster cobbled together here. Mm -hmm. And so she uh, copy and pasted a chunk of text into Google. Uh -huh. And that's what I do. That's the easiest thing, uh -huh. better than safe design for me. Uh -huh. If I see a word where I'm like, hmm, you know, uh, I don't know. I can't find the word on here that I, whatever. I don't think the student knows that word. Let me take that chunk of text with that word in it, copy and paste it into Google, and usually the first result will be, if they've copied verbatim as is done here. So that's what she did. Um, um, yeah. I mean, the fact that there's, there's no in-text citations at all is already like, you, my, my first thought is, well, where, where have you got all this information from? Yeah. Which is, and, and the, uh, the images don't have any information or like, yeah, there's no citations or links to the text, so it feels very like scattered. Yeah, yeah. So we're definitely seeing that there's text that's taken from this website without attribution. There are no citations or indications of any kind that this is not the student's original work, right? That's a problem, that, and it violates the academic integrity code, right? Um, I want to skip down to this question before we deal with like, the, the, the stuff in the middle. Is there information you need but you don't have? So, Melissa, okay. you asked, you know, how did the professor find out? What other questions do you feel like you might give you some more context for this so that you could answer these middle questions? Are there things that would matter to you if you got this in your class? Is it, is it the Final paper, or is it like a first draft? Good is question. it at least like what what paper is it? Because if it's like initial research notes or a first draft, then you have the opportunity to say, look, this is 
Okay, so if it's an earlier draft, you might want to bring the student in, talk with them, say something like, this is a big problem, and this violates the code even though it's a draft, but maybe I'm going to give you another chance to make this right before you submit your final draft. Okay? Would it be correct in my reading and interpretation of, the, of our academic integrity code? It's a little bit different from other institutions that I've been, which is which I think is more you know um, a violation is a violation is a violation. Yeah. And so whether it's the term paper or you know a small assignment that's worth a little bit or a large assignment, the violation in 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 our eyes is that's true. Is that correct? That is correct. That is correct. So. Now we're getting into this area of the discretion that faculty members have in submitting a case versus not submitting a case. Um, if uh, you look at this and it's an early draft and you're thinking, oh, the student is uh, early on in their career, uh, we didn't actually talk a lot about citing images yet, or we didn't, or this seems like notes and we didn't talk about drafts as part of the AIC, maybe I want to give them another chance, maybe I want to use this as, as a teaching moment to kind of um, get them to learn more about the code. That is within your discretion if you're not going to punish them for a code violation. If your drafts are graded and you're going to give this draft an F because it was plagiarized, you can't do that. You have to send it to the administrator. So the grading element is one of the things that I advise faculty to think about whether they're, when they're deciding, send it or don't send it. If you're like, this is an F paper because it's plagiarized, send it. If you're like, this student can take another shot at this and I'm going to help them work through it and they're going to get a grade based on what they produce after that, fine. To that point, um, it continues to come as a surprise even to faculty who have been here for 25 years or 30 years. You know, I've run into old faculty and like, really? I can't fail a student? It's like, no, you can't. In the, in the AU system, only the dean has the power to use grades for anything other than reporting on your, your academic performance. Right? So if you're at all tempted to, to, to say that I'm going to punish the student or discipline the student, or I'm not going to look at this because it's, there's cheating and plagiarism involved, then you have to give it to the AIC administrator. You don't have that power. Before speaking with the student, that's optional, right? Yeah. Uh, some faculty are comfortable talking to students; others are not. Uh, I think that um, it's best to say something to the student. I, you know, I always used to say, "Boy, you know, I'm looking at this thing, and I, I'm afraid that I have to." And what I like to say is that the dean has required that I submit this to him. To, to, to. That helps for new faculty, especially. I think. Yeah. I think that this the discretion of the faculty member is written into the code, um, but I do feel like many new faculty are more comfortable saying, if I see something that's problematic to me, I am required by the dean's office to submit it. I don't have anything against you. Mm -hmm. I'm not out to get you. And and one of the things that I stress to students when I meet with them is, look, we design. You know, you might be frustrated because you want to go talk to the professor. But this is designed so that you don't have to get into it with your professor. You want to keep that relationship with your professor strictly about your academics. Um, and here's a chance to talk to a third party who's impartial, who can, who can listen to you and see things from your perspective, who can see things from the faculty's perspective. Um, yes. And do those students get to fill out student, uh, teacher evaluations? Yes. They do, but the dean's office knows about it, right? Um, and so, you know, be, because it's all in the same circle, one right. of the things that, you know, you know yeah, one of the things that we talk about. But you know, as Matt Jones, who's implying his jobs. You're right. There, there, there is no way. The dean of the university that we're sending my student evaluations to, they don't know if the student who says, one of the worst he's ever, everything was unclear, assignment, I, I mean, I've, I had, I've written I letters like, on faculty behalf and put it in tenure files. I haven't yeah. done that for, 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 an, for somebody applying to another position, but I don't, I don't yeah. see that, that Peter would have any problem. You know, Allison would draft the letter, <laughs> but I think Peter would have no problem 
sending a letter with your teaching evaluations that said, please be aware that the scores might be lower in this in a particular course because yeah. you know she she did the right thing and the GPA the AIC. That and that's true. I, I agree. I've never done that for a faculty member, but I but well, I would. New to this. I would I yeah. would absolutely do that. But I but what you're saying is correct. There's no way to know that the the scantron where the student went down and said one yeah. is that same student. And there's no way to prove that or codify that for potential employers. And this is another reason why, for me, if you're going to write an email to a student and say, I just need you to know, you're going to be hearing from the Academic Integrity Code Administrator, mm -hmm. keep it short, keep it simple, you actually can become an advocate for them in some ways, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And I've had faculty yep. members who will say, make sure when you meet with the administrator that you bring all the things that are relevant. I hope this works out. I'm mm -hmm. just required to submit this. I hope I see you in class again. Because it is completely possible that they come through my office and they come back into your classroom. Yeah. And you don't want that to be a contentious moment. You want to keep a good relationship with them. And you can in this process because I'm the one that's going to have the bad relationship with them. Potentially, right? I think it's a beautiful system from that perspective. Is that we get to be the bad guys, and you you're doing what you know the dean you know it's like man that's my job you know this is the dean required. Yeah, so the sort of saying something I think is good, although it's up to you how you want to negotiate that. But I think if you're going to say something, keep it short and sweet, and I would say not terse, open like you know that's just my yeah. advice that from what I've job. seen faculty. How I've seen back to deal with it, and I have to say, um, coming into this role at the beginning of last year, I had had a number of cases that I myself had submitted to Michael, um, <laughs> and and the feeling of people. it, and we spoke, but yeah, um, it's a terrible feeling. I mean, it's it, when you see something that's plagiarized, like in your class, I'm like, what? I I gave you everything. <laughs> Like, I thought we talked about this. I loved you, and you've betrayed me. You know, there is an element of that, of that feeling. Um, and it's really hard not to take it personally. It's not personal. It's so not personal yeah. to you. But it's really hard not to take it personally. And so sometimes I see faculty members write to the student, like, this really long email kind of detailing every piece of what you did that was wrong and how much you wronged me in the system. You know what I mean? Because it's easy to do. It's really easy to take it personally and to express that to the student. And I would say, take a step back if you, if you feel moved to do that and let, and let me point out the issues. And I should say that of the, of the six academic administrators on this, one for each of the schools in the college, uh, none, of, none of the six are fired in Princeton types. Mm -hmm. I, I haven't, you know, there are no stories about, you know, the, the AIC administrator closing the door and pulling out the, <laughs> the light bulb um, and, and the whips. You know, every, everybody's like, okay, talk, let's find out why you're doing this, let's figure out um, what the appropriate uh, sanction is, and let's move you forward. How can you not make this mistake again? Our philosophy is education rather than punitive. The baseline sanction is failure of the course. And so most students who come through this process end up failing the course. Um, but it's it, it's not done with a kind of fire and burn job. Um, the last thing, yeah, you were, you were well, one thing about information you don't have is like how clear was the professor with their expectations for like separating like the sources and text versus what the student is commenting on about that source because like that could make a tremendous impact on the good what the students yeah, That's a great question. Yeah, what was the assignment? What were the details in the assignment? Like a rewriting for given a sign talking about how the student needs to separate the sources from their work. Definitely. Yeah, um, those are important things that would be contextual here that, that would matter. Um, other things like, what year is the student? And has the student taken a writing course here? Um, how much can we expect the student to know? If I told you this student was a sophomore, would that change the way you look at it? What if I told you it was a freshman? Would that change the way you look at it? Probably, right? What if I told you... Um, it's a grad student. What if I told you it was a grad student? That would change things, right? In terms of what you can expect or what you do expect from students of particular standing. In this case, I'll tell you the student is a sophomore. And I'll tell you that on the back of this document, you can see um, 
what the student described as sort of how this happened, which is very, very common. And so I will share with you some advice that I think is useful um, in terms of telling students. She said, uh, this is how I take notes. And I accidentally sent a file of my notes. Um, this is when I take notes, this is what I do. I copy and paste stuff from the web-based sources that I'm using, and I put them in a Google Doc or I put them wherever, and they don't match up. It's just sort of like cut, cut and pasted, right? There's no text in between. And then I write around that. And so the file that I sent is all my notes without my writing around it. I have another file that shows my writing around it. And this is really, really common. And when I have my own writing students, I, I tell them about how common this is. And I say, you know, I don't often say, like, don't do this. In a writing class, we're very much like, you know, you figure it out, right? And that's really important. But this is one of the things from like, don't do that. Don't do it. Have a system for taking notes. There are workshops at ASAC that help students take notes. Um, I show students sometimes the way that I take notes. I'm, for my own research, which is, I mean, you're all doing your own research, like, why don't you make your process transparent and sort of show students how you work, right? Um, that's another uh, kind of opportunity. But this strategy doesn't work. This strategy ends up looking like this, right? What if I told you that this was the student's second offense? What if I told you that this student's first offense looked a lot like this? What if I told you that after the first offense, the student was warned, don't take notes like this. This is not note taking. This is a bad strategy. This changes things, right? Um, and so all these things kind of factor in. Some of them you'll know and some of them you won't know. For example, you won't know about the student's history. I will. That makes it really important for you to chat with me about this, right? If you're like, oh, this is just how she takes notes. Well, what if she's been taking notes like this in every single class? What if she has a record that shows that this is not the first time she's done stuff like this, right? We have to keep track of it internally so that if this is a repeated problem, um, we know about it. Um, are the students referred to those resources we have here if they make that kind of mistake about the notes taking workshops and anything? Yes. By, certainly I do. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also, I think you were asking whether it's part of the AIC process. Yeah, I guess, like, mm -hmm. even if it's just through professors ha having that resource to refer the students to mm -hmm. like, like prior to anything happening or after the fact after the submission. It's on the CTRL template, syllabus template. Yes, the CTRL website has a syllabus template on it that's useful just to kind of start structuring your syllabus. It has things like here's the Academic Support and Access Center's content information. Here's the Writing Center's content information and stuff like that. Um, and so it's worth mentioning it in class, putting it on your syllabus, putting it on assignments. So like, these are resources for you to use for note taking, citation, anything having to do with academic integrity. These are places you should go before you turn stuff in if you have any questions, concerns. Stuff like that. I think that's good to specify exactly the examples of how the students could use that because I've seen a lot of classes where professors just kind of put it on the paper and the students don't know how to use it. Definitely. 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 The same thing is true with uh, sort of paraphrasing, summarizing, and quoting. Obviously, we work on it in writing classes, but students do it in every other class pretty much that they're in, but they're not, they don't get explicit practice. They're just expected to sort of know how to do it. Um, and so that's something that I think is one of the things that I see um, a lot of. Uh, so that's a, that's a silo question, and a mental silo question that I would really I always emphasize it in my classes, which is when I'm giving that first paper assignment, I say, do you remember when you took college writing? And do you remember how when you did a research paper, you started three weeks ahead of time, and you came up with a proposal, and you came up with a plan, and you, you, you figured out when you were going to do which drafts and, and all that? Do that again. You, you know, They taught you skills that you should be using in your class, and just that reminder that college writing was actually useful they, they silo these things. They, they don't think that what they learned in course A applies to course B. What they tell themselves is that eh, every professor thinks differently. So in all, as often as you can, if you refer to what they did in college writing, because they anybody who takes college writing has to do a research paper assignment. So they've all gotten instructions on how to draft. They've all gotten instructions on how to sign. They've all gotten instructions 
on how to um, organize information. Because of that, if you remind them of it, then they, they're more likely to hold those habits with them into your courses. Yeah. And if you haven't seen this book, uh, it's called The Easy Writer, and the initial 30 or so pages are specific to AU. Every first year student is required to buy this text. Which means that your seniors have it, your juniors have it, your sophomores. Have Some it. version. This is the new edition, but I think mm -hmm. now we're at the point where everyone has, like, we've gone through a couple of different uh, um, like publishers, but uh, everyone has this book. So you can refer to it in your syllabus. It has um, an abridged um, citation guide for all the major citation styles MLA, APA. Um, I think Chicago might be in here as well. Um, but it also has sections that deal with academic integrity. It talks about paraphrase, summary, and quotation. It gives advice for those things. So if you're not tackling them in class, you, you're not planning to, you can use sort of references to specific page numbers from this book. In college writing, we tell our students not to sell this book back. We tell them to keep it for all four years because it's going to come in handy. There's, there's grammar sections. Can so we get that as faculty? Um, you should. You might be able to buy it at the bookstore. We're in the college writing program. We have ways to get. Ask your department chair to okay. buy it for you. Yeah, you should. Okay. Yeah. You, you do know you have a discount. Right? I have to buy like any, you know, books they want. Isn't everything online now? Did <laughs> 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 we just get an email that there are no books in the bookstore? I didn't see that. Yeah, there are no books in the bookstore. I don't think we have books. Wow. They order it online. The students can come and pick up their book. Oh. That they order. There's no actual like, There's, shopping. Shopping. There's no inventory. Right. How about this? Yeah. Um, oh, I'll check with find Matt out at the bookstore and change. see what we can do. Because we've asked for the, uh, Bedford St. Martin's for um, extra copies of this. Okay. Easy and, yeah, I think there are some people working on getting more copies of this for other faculty across the university. And what do you, just for consistency, what do you teach in college writing as a preferred style? Like I say APA, but what do you guys You teach? should say APA, right? You should go with what your discipline teaches. Okay. Yes, you should. And they learn all, or? Well, so in college, it depends on what class they're, they're in. Um, some college writing professors use MLA. I use APA, but I don't teach them APA. I teach them citation. Okay. So that when they get to your class and they have to use a different citation style, they're ready to go. Okay. I teach them how to use resources like this, how to use web resources like the Purdue OWL. And I tell them that like our game is not to make you an expert in MLA because no one as an undergraduate remembers all that. It's mm -hmm. useless. It's a waste of brain space as an undergraduate. But you do need to know how to use resources to accommodate citation styles as you move along. And so that's really the goal. Allison right? can't tell the story that I can tell which is that um, there's most of us think, oh yeah, they had college writing, like how good are the faculty there? Um, and it is true that we've got a wide range of faculty in the college writing program just teaching every freshman on campus. And so we have a lot of adjuncts, we have a lot of term faculty. Um, the term faculty like Allison are amazing. Nobody on this campus is held to a higher standard than the term college writing faculty are. Um, and the, the term writing faculty um, from the college writing program consistently across the university have the lowest grades and the highest student satisfaction. It's, a, it's remarkable what this program has accomplished in Allison, one of the, one of the great gifted teachers in that program. But they, they're handing out lots of terrible grades and they're getting great student evaluations because of the kind of commitment and dedication they have in the process, the, the attention they pay to the process and what students have to do in order to write well. So you can't, you know, they'll have students say, ah, I didn't learn anything in college right here. <laughs> uh, uh, but they're usually trying to get out of something when they say that. Uh, but it's, it's really remarkable. So you can refer back to what they're doing and, and the students should be able to pull that up, even if they've had a bad experience. But if they've had my house since classes are sending you or AC, uh, Kelly and the whole group. It's a game. Um, it's remarkable what they accomplish. Well, and students have all different kinds of experiences, right? I mean, it depends on them. We tell them that from day one in any of our classes, right? Um, so th that's. that's I just have one question about whether in college writing refers the students to that. It's 
citation management software. I think ours still needs to use citations in a way that we don't spend too much time on. Yes. Um, most of us do spend time talking about, especially about like uh, easy bib or noodle bib or one of the other like cutesy bib things that will generate citations for them. Um, so Taro, EndNote, other EndNote is free to our students. Um, so Taro is better, I think, than EndNote. Um, I have uh, one of my library colleagues that I work with give uh, workshops to my students on those things. Um, but I think the bottom line is, to, but not all instructors will give instruction on those things. They'll say, workshops are happening on these things. Here's kind of a general idea of how they work. Um, the, the biggest problem is actually a, more of a root. And that is to say, when my students start the semester and try to use EasyBib, they're putting in the wrong information in the wrong places. And so they're generating a citation that's incorrect, right? If you don't know that this is an article and this is a book, right, then you're not putting the right information in the right places. They would say that's a novel. <laughs> right, right, right. And so that, you know, so we try to get to the root before some of the kind of nitty gritty. I think in some of the uh, more advanced classes, the students who are um, in uh, our, we have some writing classes that are exclusively for students who've done well on AP exams. Um, those move faster, they're intensive, um, and so some of those spend a little bit more time on things like um, citation uh, software. But I think that's gonna change because they're getting better. Right. The it's less than 10. Yeah. So we need to figure yeah. out what, what we must cover. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think of sort of, uh, I, I, I can speed through sort of what these cases are. You, you get the sort of questions that I'm hoping for you to think about as you work with your students, but as you work with your colleagues also. Um, the second paper is uh, similar in the sense that there's under, there are underlying portions and I put in a little comment bubble that draws your attention to text that is taken verbatim from a website. This paper is kind of a mix of poor paraphrases and uh, stuff that's directly taken without quotation. Um, in this particular case, this is a student for whom uh, English is not a first language. This is a student who is a first semester freshman um, are there problematic things in this paper? Yes, but some of those things factor into what happens with this situation. Um, the student uh, in this particular case uh, worked with the professor, with ISSS, and with me uh, on a remedial sanction, which was basically, let's make sure you've got a handle on this before you go forward. Let's make sure that all the rules are clear and that you can practice responsibly the research that you're required to do in these situations. And so she worked with ISSS and she worked with me. She created a new draft for this paper. She went back to the professor's class, worked with the professor for a minute, submitted a draft that was violation free. Um, and so those are the kinds of solutions that we can uh, come up with uh, that I think are important and um, for the educational uh, kind of agenda. So a couple things to note about that. The, the baseline sanction is failure for the course, but we do give lighter sanctions if we feel like the circumstances um, are right for it. So we do pay attention to the individual characteristics of the case. The second thing you would, I want to call your attention to is that remedial sanction. The faculty member wasn't involved. Right? You don't ever have to do extra work because of an AIC case. Right? That's the administrator's job. So we really, we're a very friendly group in that way. Uh, yeah. The failure um, in the course sanction, mm -hmm. did that note on the transcript apply? No. No. So the, the most common sanction, that baseline sanction is, um, we think of that as a warning, and we think of that as an educational moment, as a way of saying, this stuff is really and truly serious. It will affect your GPA. But the only people who know about it are you, the professor in the dean's office. This is not something that appears on your transcript. The F does, but not the reason for it. You know, as far as you know, anybody else is concerned, you had a bad semester, you didn't like the professor, you had a, you had a flaky, whatever it was, it's up to you whether you want to share that or not. 
the university does not think of that as reporting sanction. Sanction B on the list is failure of the course with notation on the transcript. Um, and that typically happens. In a first case, if you bought the paper, I'll give you sanction B. Right? So when somebody has, has, has bought a paper, that's that's not about like learning. <laughs> And so those cases generally go right to, to, to failure for the course with notation and transcript. A second offense um, is usually suspension, um, and sometimes dismissal from the university. I had um, a doctoral student who got that. Um, well, the next paper is the graduate student, so maybe yeah. that's... Uh, the, the next paper is very similar in the sense that it's poorly paraphrased and or stuff taken verbatim from a site with no quotation marks. The difference is that so, this is a grad student. Case three. Case yeah. three. But, but to finish up on that failure for the course with, um, with notation, the reason why we don't want to have notation in most cases is that we, we don't want this to permanently affect a student. Right? You see that on a transcript, that's that's like that's the end of some things. Um, and so that failure for the course is considered a generous <laughs> sanction, right? That sometimes it's hard for us to wrap our minds around because we excelled at school and really wanted to get that education. Um, the fourth one yeah, is yes. Um, the the fourth one is uh, an instance of dishonesty in examination. So a student in a class wrote to a professor and said, "I think I saw someone else cheating." Um, this happens a lot more than maybe you would think. It certainly was a surprise to me that, that students will report. Um, occasions where they, they suspect other students in the class are cheating. Um, and so in this case, the student came forward and reported uh, a colleague up here um, for, for cheating. The professor forwarded me the communications. I met with the witness. I met with the student. Um, this happens uh, occasionally in terms of uh, cheating. Um, five and six are uh, both sort of problematic cases. Five is where the students have the same kind of ideas, some of the same language, but a lot of the same ideas in the same order. And the same topic submitted to a professor, uh, the same professor, which is a sort of strange uh, occasion, but it happened a few times last year. Um, and then number six is inappropriate collaboration in the sciences. This is that example that I told you about where they're mixing the chemicals together, but they're supposed to be using their own language for um, the lab reports. Um, what I hope these convey to you is uh, the advice that you can distill from it. That is, um, that if students are collaborating on anything, they know what the parameters of that collaboration are. To what extent are they collaborating? Can they collaborate and use the same language? Can they not? Uh, if it, when can they collaborate? If there's a take-home quiz, can they talk to their peers? Can they not? Um, clarifying the, the rules and the parameters of uh, every assignment is really important takeaway, I think, from here. Um, the resource of your academic integrity code administrator as like, I'm looking at this thing, I'm not really sure what this is all about, it seems like it would take me some work to figure this out, can you take a look at it? Um, and the answer there is obviously yes. Um, I hope this has also sort of shown some of the stickiness between purposeful dishonesty and then this other area, which is that it's sometimes more complicated than honest mistake, right? There are lots of different reasons this is happening and there are lots of things that we kind of I want to be aware of a lot of contextual things that um, may be important to look at. Um, if they have a minute, I would like to just highlight a few things from, from my own experience of working with students. Um, I, I worked at this university for about eight years, during which time I also studied foreign educational systems and prepared something for this university, like a document, right? During which time I learned so much about other systems. A lot of students come here from centrally managed systems, right? They set curriculum, they come to the classroom, they just read it, memorize it, and then at the exam, they go ahead and just write what they had memorized, right? Which is perfectly okay. And it is ethical, it is honest. That's that's how they are, you know, uh, educated. This could be um, this, this post-secondary, this could be a secondary education. And then, especially at the graduate level, I get this issue. Then they come here, and then in the first week, we expect 100% switch. 
from that kind of thinking to the academia way of doing things, right? Well, first of all, in some cases, the students will never ask to think critically. They have no idea what is critical thinking. So you ask me to create something and come to you, Professor Manson, and tell me what I think. That was so new for the first time. Um, and the other thing is, you know, uh, this is based on the educational system. And of course, Alison, you mentioned it, um, collaboration, inappropriate collaboration. A lot of cultures are so collaborative versus our culture, which is our oh, American business culture called academia, so individuals. I, I have two children who went to Fairfax County Public School. I know that they started in elementary school learning about academic integrity. So it's very hard to compare my children, how prepared they are, to somebody coming from a system where there is no individualism, right? It is, I would have to protect you first before I think about myself. So that's another, a huge culture shift. They have to learn what we do. I am not saying anything against it, but I think in terms of looking at all those cases, right, and understanding the nuances, I think it, it's helpful to take a moment and then think about that. And my office is always available. Anytime you have any questions, anytime you would like to discuss something, I'll drop everything and then come, come sit with you. And you all are in Mary Gray. We are all in Mary Gray, and we are part of the Office of Campus Life. I've seen last semester and last year a lot of graduate student cases that I knew that were honest mistakes or lack of understanding, but at the graduate level it's even more strict. So I just wanted to put that out there. And that, you know, I, I think that uh, Michael Lee mentioned at the beginning, starting with to build that trust, because tr trust, you can tell me, is a basic human need, right? Mm -hmm. Trust. If they know that any anything that they do would be breach of trust between you and the student, you will get their attention. Thank you for allowing me to say this. Thank you guys for coming. Thank you. I have a hand up uh, with probably some of the stuff we didn't get to here. Um, some bits of advice. Um, if you have any feedback. Or questions, our contact information is on here. On the back, you'll see contact info for um, the AIC administrators and other schools, as well as the ASAC and ISSS. Um, so you can put those on your syllabus. Uh, I encourage you to look at the stuff on CTRL's website for the uh, syllabus template. Um, if you want to see examples of syllabus language, um, send me an email. I can show you some that I've seen from uh, other colleagues. I can share my syllabus with you. Um, I'm happy to help in any way um, I can. I know, I think Melissa, you served on an AIC panel before, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so if you're interested in serving on an AIC panel, now you are more expert than many of your colleagues. <laughs> so I would, I, I would definitely appreciate your service if you're interested. Send me an email and let me know. I'll put you in the pool. Um, you don't have to swim every time. Uh, there's a cave. So. Just a little plug for that.